these are the stem cells again. What are the indications here? Now forget about the green, look at the largest, the yellow, mostly myeloma, lymphoma, a little bit of Hodgkin's disease and a little bit other diseases, but uh, mostly diseases that involve the marrow less, so acute leukemia, which is the disease that undergoes allergen egg transplantation, involves the bone marrow, so it's often difficult to uh, collect healthy stem cells. These diseases, lymphoma and Hodgkin's disease, involve the bone marrow to a limited degree, so the stem cells in the bone marrow are often healthy. Uh, myeloma involves the bone marrow quite commonly, but can often be reduced to a minimum before collecting these stem cells. Uh, the big difference is here, the 100 a mortality. Remember I showed for, uh, and, and I show this because I think at least my patients get confused about this. These days with the internet, patients read about a lot, read about the risks and the side effects. Allo transplant and autologous transplant are, are fundamentally different procedures and fundamentally different risks. Here, this is again worldwide, the risks of dying by day 100, I, I mentioned it was around 10% for allo transplant. Here it's 1% or 2%, so it's still a heavy procedure. Even 1% or 2% is high. You know, it's very, very rare these days that a patient dies of immediate complication of an autologous transplant. I would say it's in our, it's not zero, it's for sure not zero. In, in every center it happens, it happens rarely, it happens most of the time when it happens it's in people with unrecognized other problems. So we had last year a patient who turned out to have underlying heart disease that we were not aware of and she didn't tolerate it. it was still, it's still a complicated procedure but it's the risk of it is comparable to that of undergoing a, a serious surgery, um, but uh, most of the time we think of this as quite safe. Uh, again, because it's so safe, we do it more and more for older patients. Here we see a lot over 60, and there the median, the average age of our patients is about, um, is about uh, 60. Lymphoma we do this mostly for relapsed lymphoma patients and we cure about 50%, depending again on, on the disease and the status of the disease, uh, we can cure quite a few patients with relapsed lymphoma with autologous transplant. Um, mantle cell lymphoma, let me skip that. Uh, multiple myeloma, it's different, ignore these uh, curves here. Mantle cell, uh, multiple myeloma, um, autologous transplant has been a wonderful procedure uh, that helps brings patients in remission but uh, and this is over time it's not a curative procedure Mo over time the most of the patients will need other treatments again and most of patients that's this yellow curve most of the patients will uh, relapse again from uh, autologous transplant for multiple myeloma, uh, although these relapses sometimes are 10 years off, sometimes they are 5 years off. There's a big effort now in uh, preventing these relapses by giving drugs after the transplant. So in, in lymphoma we don't, we don't routinely do that uh, because many of the patients are cured. In multiple myeloma there's a number of studies of using uh, new drugs and a variety of drugs and there's now some quite interesting data that are very recent on giving the drug Revlimid after autologous transplant and it seems to really further improve the outcomes of patients who undergo autologous transplant for multiple myeloma. So autologous transplant, patients get their own cells, it's not really a transplant, it's not a true transplant, it's transplant support. There's much less treatment related mortality. It's curative in lymphoma, it leads to major improvement of life in, in uh, multiple myeloma. Now, second part, um, what are quality of life, what is quality of life? Um, it's a, I thought I'd talk a little bit about common complications and about what to do about them. You know, quality of life is, 
you know, living and being healthy and being able to do what one wants to do and avoiding serious problems. Um, uh, hopefully that's true for everybody. Unfortunately, that's, that's not true for everybody after an allogeneic transplantation particularly. So autologous, I'll talk a little bit about complications of autologous transplantation, the second part. I would say that the majority of our patients undergoing autologous transplantation are go back to normal health after a period of a couple of months and, and don't have to look back. Um, the major issue with autologous transplant is how do we make it safer? How, how, not how do we make it safer, how do we make it more effective? How do we prevent the disease from coming back? In donor transplant, a lot of our problems relate to minimizing complications and dealing with complications. The first complication is graft-versus-host disease. And uh, what is graft-versus-host disease? Somewhat difficult to explain, but um, it's a reaction of the graft, meaning the bone marrow of the donor, against the host, meaning an attack of the of the, uh, of the bone marrow of the donor against the recipient's body, against the host, the recipient. It's, uh, why does this happen in bone marrow transplant? It happens because when we give these donor cells, we want to give blood producing cells so that blood can be uh, made. But at the same time, we all also give cells of the immune system of the donor. And the immune system, our immune system, is meant to uh, detect infections and other organisms that attack us, bacteria. We have a cold, the immune system reacts against it. We have a bloodstream infection. So here we give this immune system of this donor, and that donor is carefully chosen to be as similar as possible to the recipient. He is HLA, he or she is HLA, identical as we went through. Still, it's not the same person. There's still huge differences. I am not the same as my brother, unless the rare circumstances that we do a twin transplant. So patients and donors, that the immune system recognizes the host and attacks it, and attacks it with a vengeance sometimes. And what are the organs that are most susceptible to attack by these donor cells? It's the, the skin, the gut, and the liver and we get skin rashes, we get um, uh, gut involvement and patients can get severe diarrhea and we can get liver inflammation that the patients are not aware of uh, but that we are aware of as physicians by doing liver tests. Uh, what is the treatment for it? Uh, the best treatment is preventing it and, and every patient goes on medications for preventing graft versus host disease. If we wouldn't do that Despite choosing the donors for matching, everybody would get this graft versus host disease. Uh, so we have to put everybody on either tacrolimus or cyclosporin misspelled here. Those are the two most important drugs that I would say close to 100% of the patients worldwide is at least for a while on one of these two drugs. They are both very similar drugs. There's usually a second drug. There's glucocorticoids, steroids, prednisone. There's mycophenolate. Uh, there's some centers use drugs prior to the transplant, CAMPATH or ATG. Despite administering these drugs, um, one still gets graft-versus-host disease in a number of patients. There are ways of preventing graft-versus-host disease completely. Um, we know how to do transplant. It was done. We can, we can manipulate the stem cells of the donor in such a degree that uh, all the graft-versus-host disease is avoided. However, uh, that has a flip side. Uh, the flip side of that is that, uh, one, typically the donor's immune system then can no longer react against infections, and such patients become very prone to infections.